How many of you have heard of the Grass March and Grant Gerber riding coast to coast? How many of you have heard of Smoked Bear? Tonight we're representing Smoked Bear. My name's Travis Gerber, my brother Zachary Gerber. We're sons of Grant Gerber who passed away two years ago and no one would have wanted to be here more than him and, and to speak at this symposium, but we're happy to be here in his stead and we brought his saddle here tonight that he rode cross country with to carry petitions to Congress for the transfer of lands and other grievances. And, okay, and uh, if, if Grant wants to join us here tonight, we brought his seat. And I brought some slides to show you. Um, we're gonna talk about Smoke Bear and I'm gonna tell you the origins of this campaign. This was a radio campaign and an educational campaign. As many of you know, the, our, our biggest challenge is to get the word out and to educate the public, especially people in the cities, to understand public lands, understand wildfire, and the Smoke Bear campaign is a perfect vehicle to do this. And if any of you are interested in helping with this campaign after tonight, please contact Zachary and I. Uh, Smoke Bear was an idea that my dad came up with probably in around 2008 he had a growing concern about wildfires in Nevada. As a boy, he'd grown up as a fourth generation Nevadan. This is a picture of his great grandfather, Matthias Glazier, who came through on the California Trail, passed through Nevada in 1852 to California. And when he was in Nevada, he lost some horses near Elko and was able to scope out and, and learn the area be, while searching for these horses. But he went on to California and uh, much later, I think more than 10 years later, he came back and settled a ranch there near Elko in, 18, in the 1860s. And our family's been there ever since. And Grant was a fourth generation Nevada, and Zach and I are fifth generation. And he grew up, Grant grew up on a, on a ranch called the Mountain View Guest Ranch. He, his parents bought it when he was a teenager, and he spent his teenage years, and he was in the military and other other things, but he spent a lot of time trapping and hunting in the mountains and guiding people on mule deer hunts. And there's Grant in Hole in the Mountain, uh, the second highest peak in the Rubies, looking through the hole. And there was a magazine article that was written in the, night, in the late 1950s, and, and Dad took the newspaper reporter up to the top of the mountain and took these photos. But Grant learned a great appreciation for agriculture for wildlife, for hunting, fishing, all different activities. And he became a, a good horseman, a good guide, and it served him well. He later served as an intelligence officer in the Vietnam War. He, he, uh, he, he guided a, uh, a ski team for, for the uh, special forces here, right here in the, in the Wasatch Mountains, and later uh, eventually became a captain in the Green Berets. So all these early experiences served him well. But he learned a lot about wildlife as a young man. And as you can see here, they, the, these pictures are of one day's hunt in the Ruby Mountains. Back in the 1950s, the mule deer were abounding. And as Grant went through life, he learned, and as, especially as he saw the mule deer herds declining in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, he began to ask, why is this happening? And he studied the history, and there was a, there was a, a the earliest journal of Peter Skeen Ogden, the first trapper to go through Nevada uh, in 18, 1828, recorded that there were very few, very few wildlife in Nevada, so few that they did not spot any deer or any, any large game in northern Nevada as they passed along the Humboldt River trapping beaver. And also, uh, as I showed you, Matthias Glazier and the early settlers and, and explorers of Elko County in northern Nevada, they also found very few wildlife. Peter Skeen Ogden, the first explorer, the only way they were able to get out of Nevada was to shoot and eat their own horses to get back up into Idaho where they could find game, dry the meat, and then come back through on a return trip for beaver through Nevada. But it was the efforts of the ranchers in the Great Basin that, that uh, cultivated the ground. They took the small streams and 
irrigated them into broad meadows, which created the habitat for the wildlife that was abounding when he was a boy. It took several generations for that to happen. My grandfather, who was raised in the 1930s, saw his first deer uh, as, as a young teenager in the 1930s. There, there, just, there just weren't very many deer. The Forest Service own numbers show that in 1917, there was only 40 deer in the entire Ruby Mountains. But by the 1950s, there was over 60,000 deer in those mountains. It was a direct result of cattle and sheep ranching, especially sheep. As Hank, Hank Vogler and others will tell you, sheep are very symbiotic with deer, as are cattle. And also, given the heavy predator control, the use of poisons, other things, uh, the, the deer and bird populations in the 1950s were abounding. Many famous people came to Elko County just to hunt. And that's how our family survived in those days, was guiding those, those visitors. So Grant knew all this history and, and wildlife history, and that, that ultimately culminated with his big ride to Carson City. This is us riding into the governor's mansion in Carson City on the grass march, asking the governor to help reverse this trend of the removal of cattle and sheep from the range. Grant saw that that removal was resulting in decadence of the range, which was resulting in a buildup of fuels, wildfire, and here's a chart that Grant came up with of Nevada fire history, showing that from when he was a boy in the 1950s, the fires were relatively few in number and, and few in size. But by the 1990s and 2000s, fires were expanding so rapidly and burning over areas that had already been burned, which gave rise to invasive species like cheatgrass and so forth, that, that Grant said, why is this happening? In fact, there's been studies of the Great Basin, even by the U.S. Forest Service, saying that there's been a buildup of woody fuel in the, in the Great Basin. It's a direct result of taking the cattle and sheep off the range. So Grant came up with this campaign called the Smoke Bear Campaign. And all of you know Smokey on the left, and Smoke Bear is on the right. This is a cartoon that Grant commissioned from a professional artist out of, out of Hollywood. And uh, both of these bears were orphaned in fires. In 1950, Smoke Bear was a little black bear that was found in a New Mexico forest with burnt paws and uh, had climbed a tree to escape the fire but was burned and, and was, was orphaned. And he was adopted by the U.S. Forest Service as their mascot. On the other hand, Smoke Bear was a grizzly bear. And he was also orphaned in a fire, but rather than going into government service, he worked in the private industry, and he worked as a miner and a logger and a driller, a cowboy. He, he did it all. And, and both bears are friends of the animals, and both bears want to stop the fire. Smoked, smoke, Smokey Bear, his uh, slogan is, only you can prevent forest fires. Right? Is that true? Uh, not when we don't control the land, right? His message is, put out your campfires. Prevent the spark. On the other hand, Smoke Bear's message is, there's also another element to fires, and that's fuel. The only way to control the fuel is to control the land and to manage the land. With environmental and preservation philosophy abounding in our government, there is a buildup of woody material on the range and on the forest because it's not being properly managed like it was in the 1950s when we had our heydays of wildlife and, and birds. So here's Grant. This is the first time that we took Smoke Bear out to meet the people and to visit the forest. And, and it happened to be when the Arizona Bear Wallow Forest burned. And we flew down with Smoke Bear. This is a, a full-size mascot costume that, that Grant purchased. And, and uh, we visited that fire, and we visited some schools in Springerville, Arizona, and they were so happy to see smoked bear and to see that someone was talking about reducing the fuels on the range. And everywhere we went, the children were just so happy. And, and one of the things Grant was surprised about is he thought that when he brought out this smoked bear mascot and this smoked bear campaign, he was going to get incredible opposition from the government, from environmentalists. But to his great surprise, it was silent. Nobody opposed this message because Smoke Bear was talking about how wildfires kill 
millions of birds and animals. And here's the forest in, in the Bear Wallow Forest, one of the largest, I think the largest fire in Arizona history. Burned 40 miles of the mountain and devastated the mountain. Um, killed everything, even the microbes in the soil, because the trees had been allowed to accumulate to over 1,500 trees per acre to where when the fire caught it just burned the entire forest and everything in it. And I was surprised. I'd never seen devastation like that in my life. I, we walked into this forest, and I was surprised there weren't even any bugs. There was no flies. There was no birds. There was nothing. And the fish were dead. Um, everything that didn't have wings or long legs, of course, was killed, all the small creatures. But even the larger creatures, many of them suffered burned hooves. Um, and many of the larger animals die of smoke inhalation. So here's smoke bear in the, in the burned out forest. And this all could have been prevented by better management. We, Zach and I, and we learned from our father, we believe wholeheartedly in the American Lands Council, the message that these lands need to be transferred to state ownership and so that they can be managed by local people who will not tolerate this kind of waste and this kind of uh, destruction. I'm going to turn the time now over to Zachary to talk about pollution. Thank you. Uh, my name is Zach. Thank you. My name is Zach Gerber. I'm the youngest of the Gerber family. And uh, Travis and I are both lawyers. We were uh, blessed to work with my father, uh, Travis, for several years and uh, me for a year. And uh, while dad started the Smoke Bear campaign, uh, I was in law school down in Miami. And uh, he, he was focusing on all of the millions of animals that are burned by wildfires. He, came, he talked to a lot of uh, ranchers, um, scientists, and came up with a number of three animals per acre, which uh, was very conservative based on all the experts that he spoke with, uh, that die in wildfires and that are existing on uh, each acre of land. And so if you can imagine, if there's a million acres burned, there are a lot of animals that are killed. And while he was focusing on this campaign and coming up with these numbers and researching the government's numbers of how many acres are actually burned, he also started thinking about pollution. And he contacted me to research pollution. And so I started looking into this um, a little bit. And it was interesting to find at first that there was not very much information or research done on wildfire pollution. And actually, the numbers are buried in articles and re uh, re research articles. And even some of the articles, uh, the, the researchers said, we need to be very careful with this information because if it gets out, it can be damning and very damaging uh, to some, some people's efforts. And so uh, I, I spent quite a few, quite a few months uh, looking into this. And I wrote an article about it, and we brought uh, copies that are up here if you'd like to, to read it. Uh, and it's also on smokedbear.com. Um, but to begin, I, I first looked at, uh, tried to find a benchmark on what is a lot of pollution? What, um, who produces a lot of pollution? And so I found on the University of Massachusetts website uh, that they listed the top 10 polluters, uh, corporate polluters in, in the United States. And you can see them here. Uh, one of them that I, I picked out uh, almost immediately that I knew was ExxonMobil, which was ranked number four. And as you can see, uh, I've circled down there uh, the amount of millions of pounds of toxic air releases that ExxonMobil produces in, uh, in that year period. And uh, so I kind of got that as a benchmark. And I, I started thinking, well, what is ExxonMobil doing to reduce uh, their air pollution and the pollution uh, that's, you know, that's being emitted into our country and throughout the world? And uh, I found several articles that talked about just how much money they're putting into this. For instance, they were required to spend $571 million to, uh, to clean up uh, some of their power plant, or uh, excuse me, some of their oil refineries. Also, down on the bottom article, it said uh, they were uh, required to pay $135 million on cleanup efforts. So they're putting in hundreds, literally hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars, which equals billions. Um, very, very quickly. Uh, as, I, as I started studying, I found another polluter, a major polluter, and I'll call it the polluter. 
And this polluter didn't make that top 10 list, or it wasn't on the top 10 list, I should say. And uh, to give you some numbers, just one, in, in one uh, incident, uh, there, was this, there was this article uh, that talked about this. And it said in, early, in the early 2000s, from June through August in this year, the polluter produced approximately 30 teragrams of carbon monoxide. And one teragram is about 2.2 billion pounds. So 30 times 2.2 equals 66 billion pounds of carbon monoxide, just carbon monoxide. Those numbers that we were talking about before for ExxonMobil were all the toxins they produce. This is just carbon monoxide by itself. 66 billion pounds in three months. Uh, and th that's, that's a lot of carbon monoxide. And so if you put, put these uh, two do, uh, together, you look at the polluter on, the, on your left and the ExxonMobil on the right, 66 billion pounds of carbon monoxide, as I said, in three months. While ExxonMobil, 9.82 million pounds of all toxins in one year. So to put those next to each other, uh, this polluter that's on the left uh, produced way, way, way more than uh, ExxonMobil. ExxonMobil didn't even make this graph. It didn't even make the chart because it produces so much less than this polluter. So who, um, well, just going back, if, if, uh, if this polluter was a corporation, there's no doubt that uh, the, the president, all the executives would be in jail. There is no doubt. Also, if, if the fines and the requirements of this polluter to clean up the air were commensurate with those fines that were placed against ExxonMobil, this polluter would be able to pay off the national debt. They would be uh, paying so much money to clean this up. So who is this polluter? I think you probably already know. It's the United States government uh, with all the fires that are burning throughout the, uh, the, the nation. This, uh, this specific fi fire, I thought this quote that was buried down in this, uh, in this research from the Nevada Center um, of Atmospheric Research, which is NCAR, put out this, uh, this research and in, buried in the middle was this quote. It said, we were surprised to learn the magnitude of the fires and their impact. Uh, Fister said, from June through August, the fires produced approximately 30 teragrams of carbon monoxide, which I said was 66 billion pounds, roughly equal to all the human-generated carbon monoxide for the entire continental United States during the same period. That is a major statement right there. This one, one fire produced more carbon monoxide than all of the tailpipes, all of the industrial pollution in the United States for that same period. That is a tremendous amount of pollution. Uh, their study estimated that the boost in carbon monoxide and other fire emitted pollutants increased ground level ozone up to 25% in the northern continental United States and by up to 10% in Europe. This fire sent pollutants all the way to Europe. I mean, it's polluting the entire world uh, as we see it. And so uh, we have a friend named Roy, Roy, Royal Orser and he put this uh, cartoon together. He does some political cartoons. And we thought this one hit it right on the spot. On the, on, uh, the left, it, it uh, has the corporate polluters. And it says, yield smokestack pollution capped fuel. And on the right is uncapped fuel, which is the government allowing uh, the forests, allowing, the, uh, um, allowing all the public lands to burn up. And as Travis uh, had mentioned, our father saw that uh, fires were increasing. They're, they're increasing tremendously in Nevada and throughout the 11 western states. And uh, it's, it's devastating to see that this is producing million, literally millions and millions of pounds of pollution. And so with my father, we, we looked up uh, the fire numbers on uh, the BLM website and the different uh, uh, other governmental websites to see just how much fire was being produced. For instance, in 2011, uh, wildfires in Nevada, there were 424,000 acres uh, that burned. Um, and then using that three animals per acre, that equals 1.2 million animals that burned in those wildfires during 2011. And uh, pounds of pollution would be uh, 4.2 
million uh, pounds of pollution. So you here in Utah, you wonder where this inversion is coming from. I'll tell you where it's coming from. It's coming from us in Nevada. Our, our land is burning up and it's coming over here. And uh, I also found, uh, to go to the economics of this, the United States uh, Forest Service, they put out um, this, I believe it was in 2015 article, the rising cost of wild op wildfire operations. And these were their numbers. So right now, uh, they're, they're spending, it, it says one million, but if you look up, this is in 1,000s. So one billion um, dollars are being spent on fighting wildfires, and that's just only going to increase based on their budget. And at the same time, they're, admit, they're admitting that land management dollars are going to decrease dramatically and that they already have. And so they're spending their money on fighting these wildfires, but nothing on the range management. And that's why something's got to change. All this cash is just burning up. That's all there is to it. And it's burning, producing millions and millions of pounds of pollution, burning millions of animals. If people really care, they would look at the heart of this and get those fires stopped. Rather than focusing on uh, corporate America, they would look at the U.S. government and see that they are the worst landowner in the United States, in this country. The federal government is the worst landowner. They're producing millions and millions of pounds of pollution, more than all of the industrial pollution combined. Um, so, looking at this, as I studied it, I started getting, feeling pessimistic about the future and where we were headed, that things are just getting worse. But it was interesting, if any of you ever spoke with my father, he was always an optimist, always an optimist. Uh, even, even when there were insurmountable odds, he was always optimistic, and he was working for a, a plan to overcome this. And we believe that his crowning event was helping to found uh, the American Lands Council and helping to transfer those federal lands to the state level, and so we have local control here. And that is the solution that is big enough. That's how we're going to overcome this, to drop those pollutants um, from being emitted in these wildfires, and also to save millions of animals from being uh, burned in wildfires. So we're grateful that all of you are here and that you invited us to, to be here today and to present. And if you have any other questions about Smoke Bear and its mission of informing the public about the millions of animals that are being burned each year in wildfires and the millions of pounds of pollution that are being spewed into the environment, we're happy to talk. You can also go to smokebear.com and we have our article right up here on the table. So thank you very much. Thanks, Zach. That's some hot stuff right there. I just see if you're sleeping, Ronnie. Come on. Quit texting like a millennial. Good grief. Chick. All right, questions. I have a question. Is there going to be beer in here tonight, Dave? Dave. Oh, it's coming? Okay. Questions? Seriously? Anybody? Yes. Oh, you got a question, Ronnie? the equivalency between this pollution and um, say volcanic eruptions uh, I haven't studied you got a microphone right there Zach I, I haven't studied volcanic eruptions that would be an interesting uh, thing to pursue you, you can read this article up here it talks a little bit about other pollutants uh, such as mercury which is one of the the worst and uh, a lot of a lot of uh, environmental groups are uh, focusing on mercury right now and trying to reduce corporate emissions of a mercury, mercury. But wildfires, um, I mean, the corporate pollution pales in comparison of what wildfires actually produce. So I, about volcanoes, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure. Yeah, uh, right now legislation is focused on uh, reducing CO2, uh, carbon monoxide emissions, and that's exactly what these wildfires are producing. So if we want to limit Pollution. The easiest, the easiest way to do that is to prevent wildfires. Um, also, heavy metals like mercury are, are hot on the radar screen, and there's many articles out there showing that wildfires emit mercury because mercury is found in every uh, living plant, and when that plant burns, it gets released into the atmosphere, and then comes down and settles on the soil, and then when the soil gets blown, it gets it gets blown into lakes and rivers and streams. So, um, the another way to prevent the mercury pollution is to avoid fires. 
Question two. I'm still trying to grab your name. Uh, Tom Cullen, I represent American Mining Rights. And I'm still trying to grapple with how local control would be better than uh, the federal government control, especially with states like California and every other state following their lead. We all know what California is capable of, and it's getting worse and worse and worse there. How is local control going to be better than fixing the existing system? My answer to that is local control is more responsive than federal control, and it's also tailored to fit the, the, the community. Right, it, your concern is, is if you live be, in an urban area be, or... No, it would still be a state control. Okay. It would not be county. You're, you're going to be under the regulations of the state if it all goes to local control. Right, I see your concern. Now, if it is state control, it's still closer to the local population than 3,000 miles away in the federal government. Yeah, That's our point, right. is that the government is going to be more responsive. The more representation we have uh, over these lands, the more responsive it is to the people. When state government does not listen to the people, then what are you going to do? I didn't hear that last part. If the state government doesn't listen to the people, what are you going to do? At some point, at some point, the people will reach an equilibrium with their state government where, where they're either putting food on the table or they're not. Uh, whereas the federal government is so far removed from us that, that, that there is no economic connection with the land. It's, so, it's too far extenuated. But the state governments can actually feel that feel that pressure, the local governments can feel that pressure a lot faster than, than, uh, than if your, your representatives are 3,000 miles away. I have a sense that we have a, a sentiment for local control coming right now. Yeah, um, I would like just to comment on that. Uh, I think it's a great question for tomorrow because we're going to have a full panel tomorrow afternoon that I'd like to have everybody's input on this. But I think, it, again, it goes back to jurisdiction. In, in, in every given state, you have, you have uh, district court um, set, set, set up across the state. So you would be working within your district if you, have you had an issue that had to go to court. And you would, I'm certain you would want to be tried by a, a, a group of citizens from your district rather than a group of citizens from, that could come from all over the United States in a federal court. That's the jurisdictional issue is, is, is really key on that. I got a local control thing, then I'm coming to you, Todd. Chuck Miller, Brush, Colorado. Well, I'm not very good at asking questions, so I want to develop a question for tomorrow and see if we can produce an answer. But we polluted a river in Colorado that was swept under the rug. We polluted our airspace with the fires, as you showed us, and nothing's being done. So please develop the question and the answer. Okay. You got your homework assignment. So a comment or two, and then a question. but. With respect to the federal versus local control, I guess my comment would be this, I, and I think you've already addressed it. I think it comes down to a big picture prevention issue by removing the fuel. And that's not happening now. It, it's just not. That's what you talked about with the smoked bear campaign and all of that was that these fuels, which include a lot of these forests that are being mismanaged, there's just way too much built up fuel and if states would manage those differently and the rangeland, I think that would make a, a big difference. But ultimately it does come down to resources because it's true, fighting fires costs a lot of money. It doesn't need to cost near as much as it's costing now if it was done more effectively and they would got, get on it sooner. But like Tim said, if these lands are managed differently and the resources are that money can be set aside and the resources that are necessary to fight it can happen. Now, the question. So, you guys, Zach and Travis, seem to know quite a about, bit about this fire stuff. And one of the things we've talked about here today has been the Hammonds. And of course, there's an interconnection there between what's happened with the Hammonds and fire on federal land. Something that Angus McIntosh put me on to, and there's been quite a bit of discussion about, is the fact that according to the applicable, what I would consider to be the applicable federal statute, which is section 1855 of which title, Angus? 
Title 18, USC, Section 1855. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with it or not, but it goes through. And it talks about fire. Not, it's not talking about arson terrorism. It's not talking about burning federal property. It's talking about fire on rangelands, forest service. So it's not talking about buildings and other property. It's talking about the situation that I think actually existed with the Hammonds. In other words, it talks about burning timber and grass and underbrush. And then it goes on at the end of the statute and says that if the person who starts the fire is a federal allottee exercising his proprietary rights in his allotment, it doesn't apply. In other words, that's a defense. I'm just curious if you've got any kind of a comments about, given your understanding of the fire situation generally, and maybe their situation, because it's something that I'm really interested in, and I think a lot of other people are too, if you could comment on that. Um, the, the thing my dad would say to that, I practiced law for it with him for 12 years, so I know how he thinks. Um, he would have said, that's the divine right of the environmentalists, or the divine right of the government, that we can do whatever we want, but if you do it, we're going to prosecute you. We're going to have a penalty for this. But if we do it, we're just exercising our jurisdiction. And that's something that, that is wrong and that needs to end. And, it, and going back to local control, if, if we had local control, state and local control of these resources, people would lose their jobs in an election. People would lose their jobs if they did wrong. But that's the problem with having a bureaucracy. When the power is delegated to, to bureaucrats, and prior to the 1930s, there was an anti-delegation doctrine that these powers could not be delegated from Congress to anyone else for lawmaking or, or interpreting the law. And with, with the, the proliferation of these federal agencies and bureaucrats, we have a big problem. They're unaccountable. We can't vote them out. They're 3,000 miles away, or at least their bosses are 3,000 miles. They're nameless, they're faceless, they move around, they don't hold office. It, it's, it's a very, very frustrating situation to hold anyone accountable for the management of our public lands. I just want to hit on that uh, real quick, too, on, on uh, the difference between local management versus federal. It, it's perfect with uh, the grass march ride my father did. It, I don't know if a lot of you have followed that, but the Tamaras were kicked off their land. They own, they own the majority of, uh, of this ranch, but they were kicked off because a BLM director, um, he had his own agenda, and they were no longer able to graze on that land. And so my dad had petitions put together. He wrote, I mean, 72-year-old father rode them uh, with, uh, with other riders, including Travis, down to, Washington, or down to uh, Carson City and handed these petitions to the governor. So over 300 miles they ride down. And the governor can't do anything, obviously. Um, he, he has no power over this BLM director. So my dad said, well, we're going to ride from coast to coast. So they started in Bodega Bay, California, rode all the way to Washington, D.C., uh, 3,000 miles to deliver these petitions. And uh, while they were riding up Constitution Avenue, um, uh, Neil Cornsey from the BLM called up my father and said that they wanted to meet, but my father was unable to. They were in a chuck wagon going up Constitution Avenue. And so, On a radio. Yep. So Neil, Neil said uh, he, uh, he would fly out to Elko, and he flew out and he, he met with us. And probably one of the main reasons he came out is he is from Elko. Travis went to high school with him. Uh, I, I knew him as well, but still, even even with those connections of knowing him, you can't do anything. You can't vote these guys out. They're they're a bureaucracy. They're um, they're above the vote of the people, and that that is another reason that the U.S. government is a horrible landowner. There's no control. There's nothing that can uh, that can affect these people. We need to bring that control home. Local control. Will will help out all of you ranchers here. You know what's best for the land. We shouldn't be allowing it to be uh, managed from D.C. And I know Angus will address this tomorrow. But Todd, and, and you know this, but I just want everybody else to know that's why the Hammonds were tried in the 1996 Anti-Terrorism Act because they could not pursue them under 
the, law, the section that Angus was talking about. We'll follow up on that tomorrow. Next question. I don't know if this is a question, but just a continuation of the last thought that I shared. We keep talking on and on and on how these bureaucracies are anti-liberty and they have power that they're abusing the people and taking away their life, their liberty, and the right to control their own personal property, which are our unalienable rights. At what point do we, the people, decide that we're not going to perpetuate these bureaucracies anymore? At what point are we going to say we will not comply? How m much legislation or lawsuits do we have to go through and suffer the loss of our life, the loss of our property, before we realize that we need to make this firm stand and de uh, declare our independence from these bureaucracies? That is what my father was doing. He was rallying the ranchers who were in the same sphere that he was in, and he was helping them to become educated on their rights. And then he was encouraging them to take this courageous stand to no longer perpetuate a system of legalized plunder. That's why we need to bring the control home to, uh, through the American Lands Council. If we all get behind that and uh, push for local control, we can, we can end this uh, crazy bureaucracy. Um, in response to that, it is my opinion that why would we change one landlord for another? Well, we still have the greatest government on earth. We still have the power of the vote. What we need to do is educate, and we need to, to do that effectively. Um, and we hope that the American Lands Council campaigns like Smoke Bear will eventually educate people enough to see the gains that could be made if we return our lands to local control. And, and again, I mean, if you can vote out, uh, you can much easier vote out a governor rather than, um, you know, the president of the United States. The, the, your vote's much more powerful at home. Uh, county commissioners would have more authority over uh, dealing with some of these issues. and. Bure bureaucrats uh, that are governing some of these laws, even if they're state officials, they're going to be losing their jobs much easier than somebody like Neil Cornsey that's the head of the BLM. Did we light a fire under you, Todd? You always like to hold this thing. I got control that way. You got a bureaucrat. Yeah, we, we got power control issues going on here, don't we, Trent? Anyway, I, I was going to respond to Tara's question about why we would trade one landlord for another, and I think she's hitting on an issue that's important and that we'll address a lot more, especially with Angus and others tomorrow, and I think her point is this, really, if we think about it in a landlord situation, then we're typically talking about a lease or a rent, and, and really what we're here to talk about is property rights and the concept that, that we, ranchers and other resource users, own those rights. We've talked about it before, grazing rights, range rights. And if we understand that concept, then really we don't have a landlord per se. They're our private property rights, not to all the resources, not to everything about it, but at least to those split estates that we're going to talk about. Is that kind of what you were referring to? I think you got it. Yes, and thank you. I have much to learn, and I don't want to come across as if I know everything, because I don't. And I'm grateful that I can have mentors to surround me and teach me. And I, it is my hope that these mentors will be motivated with the true principles of liberty. And that's where I will be discerning whether or not I will heed their counsel, as if they're logic and reason is based off of true principles of liberty. With that, I'm going to say thank you to the Gerbers. Thank